But I think what's really interesting too about the resale and re-commerce platforms like Depop and uh, ThreadUp, for example, is that, you know, as consumers, you know, you're not just buying used clothing, you're also on the selling side too. Hey gang, it's Thursday, July 1st. Cindy and listeners, welcome to July. And also the Behind the Numbers Daily, a new marketer podcast made possible by VTEX. Welcome to July and the second half of the year. It's not okay. Hi, Marcus. Today I'm joined by one of our directors of forecasting. Her name is Cindy Lou. Hi, Marcus. Hello, Cindy. Thanks for joining us. Today's fact, the keyboard was designed to slow you down. Why are the computer keyboard letters randomly strewn across the keys? Turns out it's not random at all. This QWERTY design, named for the top left row of letters, was invented in 1872 by American inventor Christopher Scholes for his new typewriter design. He laid the letters out this way because typists were getting faster than the machines they used, which would then cause the typewriters to jam. So slowing them down actually saved time in the long run. That's obviously not the case now, but everybody's so used to QWERTY keyboards, there's no reason to change. Hmm. Oh my God. Remember, did you guys have to take keyboard class in high school? No. <laughs> okay, that just What is this American me. tradition? <laughs> keyboard class? Yes, I remember. There was a class. You mean like the keyboard I just talked about? <laughs> yes. The key- what was the class? How to type quickly? I think so. When did you go to school, Cindy? In the 60s? <laughs> okay, I'm not that old. <laughs> Keyboard class. Is this a dream you had or is this no, like a real... Okay. Now oh, I think it is a dream. I honestly, <laughs> I, yeah, it was so long ago. All right. Sounds made up. Anyway, one out of every five keyboard hits goes to the space bar. And when you hit the space bar, you're doing it at the same time as 600,000 other people. Anyway, today's real topic, sustainability in retail. Sustainability is becoming a more and more frequent conversation. A couple of numbers for you. Nine out of 10 consumers surveyed by IBM across nine countries. Nine out of 10 said the COVID-19 pandemic was the number one factor in influencing their views on environmental sustainability. Number two, IBM notes that pre-pandemic, one out of five people reported sustainability as very or extremely important to them when choosing a brand. Today, over half do from one out of five to over half, with slightly more than six out of 10 folks willing to change their purchasing behavior to help reduce the negative impact on the environment. Number three, two thirds of Gen Z and millennial folks are influenced by sustainability when making purchases. That's from BCG and Ulta Gamma. And half of Americans recycle every chance they get. That's from uh, Civic Science. That actually seems pretty low. <laughs> the hell are the other half doing? Ah, one out of five people compost or compost. Well, talking today about sustainability and uh, Cindy, we're talking about sustainability, but there's there's lots of different parts of that. It's the umbrella term, right? So what what do we mean or what are we going to be talking about today under the umbrella of sustainability? Right. So, you know, we can call it what we want, but right now there's terms like circular economy, sustainable fashion, resale and re-commerce. And, you know, these are all terms that are being embraced right now. And I think when we're really talking about sustainability in retail, we're talking about the different practices and initiatives that retailers are implementing now. So this could be, you know, using recyclable fabrics, thinking more about, you know, supply chain and the manufacturing of products. But then also, you know, there's this new trend of uh, recirculating clothing. You know, this is not something, well, you know, theoretically, this is not something that's really new. Think of, you know, Salvation Army and Goodwill and retailers like that. But right now, there's this huge growth in what we're seeing in resale and re-commerce. And these are digital Mm -hmm. platforms that have come up over the years. And, you know, these are platforms that are making it easier for consumers to buy secondhand clothing. Yeah. So secondhand clothing, global secondhand clothing market broken down into those two bits that you you talked about, traditional thrift and donation. So 60% currently and resale, which is 40% of that secondhand clothing market. This is from ThreadUp's 2021 resale report using data from market research firm Global 
data. As you said, Cindy, the resale portion is growing very fast, currently 40%, as I mentioned, of the secondhand clothing market. It will be slightly larger than the traditional thrift and donation bit, which is bigger today, by 2023. And by 2025, resale will be one and a half times the size of traditional thrift and donation. It's remarkable growth. Yeah. And, you know, that report, you know, had lots of great data indicating the the huge growth in this market, in the resale market. And, you know, from that report, you know, what we're seeing is, you know, really this trend that really will, I think, reshape the fashion industry. And then, you know, not just in terms of where sales will be flowing, but also, you know, on a higher level, thinking about how the fashion industry can really mitigate the environmental impacts that they have, but, you know, whether it is through any of these initiatives. And I Mm -hmm. guess one of the most interesting things about this is also that, you know, the growth in secondhand clothing is in, you know, really sharp contract with the state of what we're seeing with fast fashion. So when we think about fast fashion, we're really thinking about, you know, the business model that is characterized by producing mass produced clothing at rather low cost and, you know, typically results in a lot of waste. And, you know, think of retailers like, you know, Forever 21 and H&M and Zara who are all feeling a lot of pressure, especially, you know, right now after the pandemic as well. But, you know, they've been facing a lot of pressure over the years. And this pressure really is stemming from, you know, the shifts in consumers and their uh, shift towards, you know, leading more environmentally friendly lifestyles. So thinking about the environmental impact of of the clothing industry, this pivot towards the secondhand clothing market, some say marks the demise of fast fashion retailers. True? Is that what's going to happen? Well, I think maybe not the demise, but I think these fast fashion retailers really, and we've seen over the years, they've pivoted their strategies and initiatives too. You know, they're all, you know, implementing their own programs and initiatives in resale. You know, H&M for one has, I think, long has had this program where you can bring back you know, recycled or used clothing and donate it to at the stores to receive credit. So, you know, there's lots of lots of examples of retailers, you know, adding their own um, programs to support these, you know, initiatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um, a couple of others as well. Uh, Insider intelligence analyst Mariel Soto-Reyes notes Lululemon piloting an athletic wear recycling program uh, similar to the one you just mentioned where customers can trade in gently worn Lululemon merchandise for in-store credit uh, as per CNBC. Return clothes are then sold online by Lululemon or recycled if it doesn't meet resale standards. Nike, Nike, Patagonia, REI, Levi's, they've also all launched similar trade-in and resale programs. Cindy, how much do companies need to, to do it? Is that the kind of standard at the minute? You've got other companies in the retail space. Amazon, they just announced investments in several new utility-scale wind and solar projects, claiming to be Europe's largest corporate renewable power buyer. And Ben Gemmon of Axios says uh, Amazon Renewables rollout highlights a corporate climate push. Lululemon, who we were just talking about, they've got this this program, this athletic wear uh, recycling program. And they're also saying that they're planning to make 100% of their products with sustainable materials by 2030. Of all these different initiatives, how much do retailers need to do at this point to, to satisfy customers' increasing appetite for more sustainable brands? So, you know, according to that study from Global Data, you know, they did indicate that the secondhand clothing market is expected to be twice the size of the fast fashion industry in 10 years time. So, you know, it's growing exceptionally fast. And, you know, even if the retailers, you know, are right now are just in sort of testing phase, I think they're being forced at the hand by consumers. I think this is really being propelled by consumer demand and also, you know, by the younger generation too. So Mm -hmm. thinking of, you know, the Gen Z and millennials who, you know, who have grown up with, I don't know, maybe with a more social conscious and, you know, they are really propelling this growth. Mm Mm-hmm. So, yeah, secondhand shopping is uh, seems to be this generation's going to the mall, apparently, with younger folks enjoying 
the hunt for something unique. Uh, Gen Z people also uh, apparently embracing secondhand fashion faster than any other age group, accounting for over 40% of global consumers and driving the value uh, of resale startups like Depop. Skyward notes uh, Savannah Sicarella uh, from NPR. Uh, Depop, someone we talked about recently, Cindy, fashion marketplace app recently bought by Etsy for $1.6 billion. 90% of the app's active users under the age of 26. However, this idea that young people want to or are buying more sustainable products, I wonder how true it is because there was a civic science survey that found that those 35 and older more likely to make environmentally friendly purchases than younger demographics. While the secondhand clothing market does cater towards, you know, more price conscious consumers, I guess, if you will, when we're talking about sustainable like fabrics and, you know, retailers and brands who use more sustainable, you know, practices. Yes, I think those price points might may, may be higher. But I think mm-hmm. when we're talking specifically about used clothing and secondhand goods, the price points are lower and that, you know, does attract, I think, more, you know, the younger generation, the Gen Z and millennials, um, you know, who may not have disposable income. But I think what's really interesting too about the resale and re-commerce platforms like Depop and uh, ThreadUp, for example, is that, you know, as consumers, you know, you're not just buying used clothing, you're also, you, you know, you're also on the selling side too. Like you can make extra income by selling so that, you know, there's a lots and lots of examples of people, you know, creating businesses on Depop where they're a seller and they're making, you know, pretty uh, steady income by buying mm-hmm. used goods and then either flipping it, you know, transforming those clo- th- those clothing items you know, into something else and then reselling it for a little bit of income. And they're, you know, they're making money that way. And, you know, it's, it's just really interesting to think about how, Mm -hmm. um, you know, these new platforms have come to be and how, you know, it's pushing, you know, Gen Z and, you know, the younger consumers into this more, you know, like an entrepreneurial, um, skill set. Yeah. Yeah, the resale portion um, is growing at 11 times the rate, 11 times faster than, than traditional retail. And yeah, it's good for, good for brands. Uh, as you mentioned, resale, uh, reselling goods, it could be a, a gateway to their brands for, for some new consumers who, who haven't tried them out before and then go on to buy brand new items uh, from that brand. Cindy, I want to move to the pandemic for a second. New and second-hand clothing marketplace Poshmark, they witnessed a 28% sales increase in 2020 to reach $1.4 billion, according to our estimates. How has the pandemic accelerated uh, this shift? Yeah, so it's really funny because, you know, you think about all the different types of technologies that have been accelerated because of the pandemic. And, you know, this is one of them, you know, like many other things, this just really accelerated this trend. And, you know, as I think as people became a little bit more price conscious during the pandemic, people turned to these types of platforms. And I think that same study found that I think there were 33 million people who had bought secondhand clothing for the first time during the pandemic. So that's a lot of new users. And also the one thing about the pandemic was, you know, people had a lot of, you know, people did have a lot of free time. And one of the growth drivers for secondhand clothing and especially resale e-commerce is coming from also social platforms. So think of going back to, you know, the Gen Z consumer, social platforms like TikTok have really, you know, propelled new traffic and interest in these types of platforms. And I think, you know, I was reading about one seller on Depop. She generated a lot of new interest to her site just through posting videos on TikTok. And I think she tripled her store's following within the first week of posting like a viral video on TikTok. And Mm. then also even now she's like opened a physical store in the Lower East Side. So two things I want to touch on that you just mentioned. The first one is um, you're talking about a lot of people buying secondhand clothing now. ThreadUp was saying 118 million consumers have tried reselling something for the first time in 2021. That's versus 36 million. So four times fewer who had tried reselling for the first time in 2020. That was from Amy DeClerc of Harper's Bazaar. And then you mentioned about people being price conscious, even in the, uh, the luxury space. 
Uh, that seems to be the case. Luxury resale growing four times faster than overall luxury, with luxury resale now accounting for 8.5% of overall luxury, up from 7% in 2018. It's from Lux Digital. Um, they were saying that what's driving that, it's, it's digital, it's affordability, it's collectability, it's the generational shift as well that we just talked about. Yeah, I mean, just quickly, when you talked about luxury brands too, I think for luxury brands, you know, they obviously benefit from having a very, you know, long lifespan of, uh, you know, having of mm-hmm. brand equity that doesn't stop at the first sale. So if you think about, you know, a, you know, buying a secondhand uh, luxury good, the value to consumers continues on after that first sale. And so, you know, first time buyers, I think of secondhand luxury goods are you know more likely than not to continue buying from that brand afterwards. So you're mm-hmm. building brand equity among consumers that you know if they couldn't have afforded buying it new in the first place, you know you're opening up the doors to people through secondhand products to being you know perhaps you know uh, lifetime brand loyalists. Mm-hmm. Do most consumers uh, now care about sustainable shopping despite the COVID-19 pandemics and financial impact on folks? Uh, IBM found that just over half are willing to pay a premium for brands that are sustainable and or environmentally responsible. That's what we've got time for for the first half of the show. It's time now for the halftime report. Well, we summarize the key takeaways from a lead story in 30 seconds. Cindy, your takeaways are... Yeah, you know, over the years, we've seen a lot of new interest in this space, you know, retail and brand initiatives. You know, I'm not sure how much of that is just virtue signaling, but, you know, I think in most cases, most retailers are genuinely concerned about sustainability and implementing these practices. And, you know, whether it is for the environmental good or whether it is because it is being forced by consumers, you know, so they do need to meet the demand and the interest of where their consumers are. That's it for the lead story. Time now for In Other News. First quick word from our sponsor, Vtex. Retail's next competitive threat may come from a business model or channel that didn't even exist a few months ago. This modern dynamic requires companies to adapt quickly, pivoting business seemingly overnight, something traditional commerce platforms just can't support. There's a new enterprise commerce platform on the rise, one that's fast, flexible, and doesn't require nine months and a million dollars to get up and running. Go to vtex, vtex.com slash emarketer to learn more. All right, folks, we are back today in other news. U.S. retail sales are rising, but by how much? What's been the pandemic's impact on small businesses? And what kind of retailer tech can we expect to see over the next year or two? Story one. Back in March, Trade Association, the National Retail Federation, expected U.S. retail sales to rise between 65 and 8% this year. That would have been the fastest retail sales growth since 2004. It has since revised those numbers even higher, now expecting low double digits at between 105 and 13.5% growth for this year. These numbers would be good enough for the fastest growth since 1984. That said, Lucia Matacani of Reuters recently suggested that US retail sales took a step back in May as spending pivoted to services and travel. Cindy, what's your take on the state of retail as we hit the halfway mark in 2021? Yeah, so I did a bit of digging myself into the U.S. Census's number. You know, the Mm. NRF is um, projecting their growth. But so far for the five months of uh, this year, retail sales, which, you know, I included auto and gasoline station sales and excluded restaurants. For the first five months, they're about 24% year on year. So, you know, that's... wow tremendous growth Mm -hmm. um you know obviously part of that was coming from declines last year the dip in you know i think march and april what we were seeing but you know so far this year a very very strong growth and our four year number what we're expecting so our forecast actually is uh 7.9 percent for the year you know still very strong you know in a typical retail year it's 
generally three to four percent. So seven point nine is very strong. You know, we are taking a bit more of a conservative outlook than the NRF because you know there are just numerous headwinds that we are facing. I think mm-hmm. we have inflation, huge inflation right now. So everything you know from the grocery store to the gas pumps, everything is expensive. Supply chain issues that we need to think about, and then you know also the some of the government relief, the stimulus checks that were implemented earlier this year, you know, we probably won't get anything later on. And then also, I think the extended unemployment benefits are set to expire later on this year. Mm -hmm. Story two, the pandemic permanently closed 200,000 US businesses above historical levels during year one of the virus. And it's a recent study by the Fed, uh, and as noted by Ruth Simon of the Wall Street Journal. That 200,000 doesn't include the 26 million businesses that are run exclusively by the owner, just ones with employees. To see how the pandemic affected the finances of small US businesses, into it, QuickBooks commissioned economist Susan Woodward notes the Connecticut Business and Industry Association. Ms. Woodward analyzed bank deposits of 1 million businesses, each uh, with 10 or fewer employees, so very small businesses, from every major sector and industry. She found the pandemic's biggest impact on small businesses revenues was in April 2020 when revenues were down 22% nationwide. New York was the hardest hit with revenues down 35%. In South Dakota and Utah, they were down 6%. Annual revenues at bowling alleys were down 33% by the end of March 2021. That's around $250,000 less per business. However, by this past March, the monthly revenues of hair studios were 13% above pre-pandemic levels. So it's quite the patchwork, Cindy, as you would expect by state, by industry. What are your thoughts? I mean, I think... I think my first thought is that, you know, the, the worst of it is over. So hopefully, you know, now we should be seeing upside things, you know, growth should be coming back to some of these small businesses. You know, unfortunately, you know, I do think it was it's going to take years for some businesses, if at all, to fully recover from the pandemic. And again, that's going to be industry by industry. You know, I think a lot of the like, so for example, if you think of fitness studios or, you know, going to the movies and uh, some of those types of businesses may take a bit of time to fully recover. Mm -hmm. One thing I noted uh, was uh, how many businesses, small businesses had moved to, to Facebook. 2015 to 2019, the number of businesses on Facebook, most of which are small to medium sized businesses, doubled from 40 million to just over 80 million over those four years. That was from Axios, noted by Axios. 2019 to 2021, so in those two years, half the time, the number of businesses on Facebook went from 80 million to 200 million. More than uh, 1 million businesses have set up on uh, Facebook shops. And also the number of sellers on Etsy went from under 3 million to over 4 million during the pandemic. Story three, Walmart and others recently made a new investment in self-driving car company Cruise, which GM bought five years ago to accelerate their autonomous vehicle technology. And notes Kia Kokolacheva of Axios. However, some robots are losing their jobs. Notes Sarah Nassau of the Wall Street Journal as Walmart phases out automated pickup towers that were set up in over over 1,500 stores to hand out online orders. Cindy, what retailer technology do you see being widely adopted over the coming year or two? Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the articles you had was that, you know, Walmart was investing in self-driving, a self-driving car company called Cruise. And, you know, I think that is what retailers are going to be focusing on is the, the push to last mile delivery. And obviously, that's one of the biggest battlegrounds in the online grocery space. You know, Walmart is obviously seeing a lot of competition from Amazon and Instacart and, you know, others joining this space. So, you know, I'm not surprised to see them investing in autonomous vehicles. If that means making the online grocery delivery, you know, lower cost and more scalable, then, you know, that should help them with their competition. And that is all we have time for. Cindy, thanks for hanging out. Thank you. Thank you to Victoria, who edits the show. Thank you to everyone listening. We'll see you guys tomorrow, hopefully, for the Behind the Numbers weekly listen, the Marketer podcast made possible by VTEX. Hold up. 